Excellencies and Ambassadors, Distinguished Guests and Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning. Today, I welcome you all to our roundtable on Canada's Indo-Pacific Strategy, a new horizon of opportunity, organized by BIPS in collaboration with the Canadian High Commission. The moderator for today's roundtable is Major General A.N.M. Munir Saman, NDC, PSC, President BIPS. For the opening remarks, we are delighted to have Her Excellency Dr. Lily Nikov, High Commissioner for Canada in Bangladesh. And the speakers for today's roundtable are Mr. Tohid Hossein, former Foreign Secretary of Government of Bangladesh, and Mr. Parvez Karim Abbasi, Assistant Professor, Department of Economics, East West University. Now, I would like to request the moderator to carry on with the rest of the session. Thank you. Furthermore, thank you very much. And Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you again to the BIPS Roundtable. And this month our topic is Canada's Indo-Pacific Strategy, a new horizon of opportunity. As you know, increasingly we live in an interconnected world where global challenges require collective efforts. Canada has also recognized the importance of the Indo-Pacific region and has developed a comprehensive strategy to engage with it. The Indo-Pacific region spanning from eastern coast of Africa to the western coast of Americas is home to some of the fastest growing economies, dynamic culture. Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy is built upon three pillars and they are security, prosperity, and diplomacy. And in all three pillars, Canada has elaborated in detail how they want to achieve the overall strategic goals of the strategic paper that they have issued. We now have about 13 strategies of Indo-Pacific issued by various countries and organizations, including the NATO. And all of them aim and focus on collective issues of interest. I shall come back to you again to highlight some of the key areas where these are being highlighted. Firstly, security plays a vital role in maintaining peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific area. Canada acknowledges the importance of upholding the rule-based international order, promoting maritime security, especially in the areas where trade groups are vital for global commerce. Secondly, prosperity is key to Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. The region's economic growth potential presents immense opportunities for Canadian business, entrepreneurs, and investors. Canada seeks to strengthen economic ties, expand trade, investment, and promote sustainable development in the region. And in diplomacy, it forms a foundation of Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. Canada recognizes the importance of building a nurturing, strong relationship with countries in the region through dialogue, cooperation, cultural exchanges. Canada aims to deepen its understanding of the region's diverse cultures, histories, and perspectives. In conclusion, Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy represents the commitment to engage with the dynamic and diverse region of the Indo-Pacific. Through the focus on security, prosperity, and diplomacy, Canada aims to contribute to a stable, prosperous, and rule-based international order. With that very brief introduction, I shall now go back to our panel, and I have the pleasure to welcome Dr. Lili Nichols, High Commissioner for Canada in Bangladesh, to give her opening remarks. High Commissioner, you the floor. Um, Assalamu alaikum, Shuwa Shakal. Um, great to see you all here this morning. Uh, there's a lot of brain power in this room. 
So um, as I said to my colleague, I'm going to be asking you some tough questions. Um, but I do welcome this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, the significance of Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. I also would like to uh, really thank my fellow panelists, um, uh, Mr. Parvez, uh, Kareem Abbasi, for being here. I just learned that we both studied at the same university. So that already uh, puts him right at the top of my list. Um, I would like to uh, thank Mr. Uh, thank you the same, um, and of course our, our good friends from 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 Disney and especially General Amani Rasaman. So thank you so much for co-hosting this with us. Um, I want to talk um, about three areas. I mean, I want to first of all say a little bit about what the IPS, the Indo-Pacific Strategy, means for Canadian foreign policy. I want to talk then a little bit about some of the key areas. Um, some of the, the main pillars that are most relevant to Bangladesh. And I really want, try, want to link that uh, to um, our common interests in Bangladesh. Um, and then thirdly, I, I do want to pose some, some challenges uh, in advancing, uh, not just our ideas, but as you mentioned, there's now 13 in different Indo-Pacific strategies. So some of the challenges and, and some questions to you, um, because you know we do have here uh, such expertise. So um, maybe just to start by saying that the Indo-Pacific strategy for Canada, which was uh, officially launched in November, really is uh, one of the most important uh, policies, Canadian foreign policy, uh, in decades. Uh, and it is really um, a generational shift in Canadian foreign policy. And it is a recognition of Canada as a Pacific nation. Uh, it is a recognition of the growing importance of the Indo-Pacific. And, and it's a couple of facts here that are really important, I think, uh, to highlight. Uh, you mentioned some of them already, General. One is that you know two-thirds of the world's population is Indo in the Indo-Pacific. Um, you know, uh, two-thirds of the global middle class is in the Indo-Pacific, and half of the global GDP uh, will be in the Indo-Pacific by 2040. But in addition to that, one out of five Canadians has some kind of link to the Indo-Pacific. Either they come from this part of the world or they have family uh, or business links in this part of the world. So I think with Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy recognizes that our futures are interlinked and that Canada wants to be a key partner a long-term, a reliable partner in the Indo-Pacific, that the Indo-Pacific really will be at the cutting edge of you know, where the world is heading in, in future decades. Canada wants to be part of that. But it's also about promoting Canadian interests and Canadian values as well. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that those things together uh, really make it what, you know, you know, in my Canadian colleagues are calling a generational global shift for Canadian foreign policy. Um, by the way, in the case of the Canadian IPS, um, the IPS also comes with a significant uh, investment of $2.3 billion in the region, a series, uh, a special envoy for the Indo Pacific, uh, Ambassador Ian McKay, who's currently Canada's ambassador to Japan. And a series of other initiatives, including um, you know technical assistance, scholarship, trade missions. So um, you know Canada really is putting its money where its mouth is when, when it comes to the strategy. Um, but let me say a little bit about um, some of the key components of the strategy and, and how they um, relate to Bangladesh in particular, and, and how we see Bangladesh. In these areas, because um, as a general, as you mentioned, uh, one of the characteristics of the Canadian IP is that it is extremely a comprehensive approach. So one of the key areas is that of peace and security. That's one of the key pillars. And the objective in that area, of course, is an open, a free, an inclusive, and a secure Indo-Pacific. And here, Bangladesh is key. Right? If you had to throw a dart in the middle of Asia, it would land in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, you know, Bangladesh is at the core of the Indo-Pacific. And, you know, it is 
an increasingly important player in the security sphere. Also to keep in mind here is that it is going to be a free and a secure Indo-Pacific. You cannot have a million refugees in a country. And that's an issue that we need to continue to work on together. So that's something that is very important, I think, for both of our countries uh, to ensure that we keep collaborating and working um, on the Rohingya crisis. And of course, we recognize how much Bangladesh has done to welcome uh, the Rohingya refugees. But it's really important that moving forward, we stick together and we work together towards solutions as the crisis has become protracted. And as, you know, other global crises mean that there's something, you know, a distraction of other crises and less funding for it. So we, that's very important for peace and security in the region. But it, it's more than that. From a Canadian perspective, um, Bangladesh is also very key as a peacekeeper. Uh, Canada and Bangladesh are both leaders in the area of peacekeeping. We actually held a major conference, a uh, global conference, um, last week on doing peacekeeping. Bangladesh, as you probably know, is the largest provider of peacekeepers in the world. And both Bangladesh and Canada were champions of Resolution 1325 over women's peace and security. Both Canada and Bangladesh have developed national action plans on women's peace and security. So both are very, very uh, active in that area. And it's an area where we want to continue to work very closely um, with Bangladesh. So those are very, very key in the area of peace and security. Uh, the second major uh, pillar of the Indo-Pacific strategy is, uh, is economic growth. And here it's um, an area where Canada recognizes uh, how important uh, Bangladesh's um, stable economic growth has been over the past decade, how significant the achievements of Bangladesh are, reducing Global, you know, uh, Bangladeshi extreme poverty from 90% to 9% over the last 50 years is unprecedented. Right? Uh, the, the, the way that has been done, the speed with which that has been done. And yes, of course, during COVID, most countries have had a bit of a rollback of that, but it doesn't take away from the achievements uh, that have been um, gained in, in this area. And Canada, from the beginning, um, was part of that as well. Um, by supporting Bangladesh. You, many of you may know that Canada was one of the first countries to recognize Bangladesh's independence and to provide food aid at the time when that was what it was most urgently needed. But over the last 50 years, we've stayed together as mutual partners and have contributed to developing the of the country in various areas as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so in the area of um, Economic growth, um, as I mentioned, the relationship maybe started with a focus on food aid and international assistance, but it has expanded significantly over the last 50 years. And today, it's a, it's a very uh, dynamic economic relationship. Our two-way trade actually is $3 billion that has increased significantly. Um, and our main goal, and one of the big challenges, of course, is to diversify uh, the trade relationship and to increase the uh, investment in particular. And here, um, Canada, as, as part of the Indo-Pacific strategy, is looking at new areas of work. Uh, it's IT, pharmaceuticals, um, green technologies, agro-processing. These are all areas in which Canada has expertise and where we're interested in working with Bangladesh. Um, in the RNG sector as well, um, you know, most of uh, Bangladesh exports to Canada are in the RNG sector, and you probably know that Canada has provided generalized preferential tariff status to Bangladesh. So we're also looking at how you continue to work in this sector in a way that's not just safe, but environmentally sound, uh, and also, you know, very much attuned to labor rights, human rights, women's rights. So that moving forward is going to be extremely, extremely important. Um, in the region as a whole, during the IPS, Canada will be sending more trade missions 
Um, so if that will be an opportunity for, for Bangladesh to be part of those. It will have, we will be naming a trade envoy for the, for the region in specific. And Canada is also very interested in joining the Indo-Pacific Economic um, Framework for Prosperity. So definitely, you know, whether it's the, fr the economic framework or, or being more engaged in regional commissions or being more active in ASEAN, Canada <laughs> wants to be part of what's happening in the region economically. The third area is that of um, resilience and um, green, a green future. And here is an area where I think both Canada and Bangladesh face very important challenges. We're very different, but we're both extremely vulnerable when it comes to climate change. I mean, Bangladesh is a delta that is constantly flooded, and Canada is in the Arctic, which is mountain. So both countries depend on addressing climate change issues. Now, Canada has globally made major climate financing commitments of $5.2 billion to help developing countries look for climate change solutions. But in addition to that, uh, Canada's IPS commits $750 million to build sustainable infrastructure. So there's a recognition uh, that countries like Bangladesh and other countries in the region uh, you know, require and uh, should be able to rely on Canadian support for climate change solutions. In our own development program here also, uh, we're beginning to shift into the area of uh, climate change, being aware that in, in Bangladesh, you know, uh, biodiversity, you know, of birds, fishing, forests, and areas like the Chilicon Hill Tract, the Zundabas, are absolutely key for that. So supporting a preservation in those areas has been a priority. Um, also, um, as part of this, um, Canada is very interested in um, you know taking advantage of its own innovations in this area. Um, Canada is a master of growing food because our country is so cold. We need to learn very innovative ways of growing food um, agroponically. Uh, we're masters of, of um, marine and coastal management. And we have technology, for example, we use satellite technologies uh, to measure and to map out oceans. So this is an area, examples of areas where Canada and Bangladesh can collaborate. A good example of how we collaborate in this area is actually the recent um, inauguration of the Banga Bandu Pierre Elliott Trudeau Agricultural Technology Center, which is a collaboration between uh, the Bangladesh Agricultural Research Center and the University of Saskatchewan. And through this initiative, it's, we want to create a long-term partnership where we're helping each other with technology, with scholarship, uh, looking at issues that are critical to Bangladesh, like post-harvest loss and food seed varieties. So it's the kind of collaboration that we want to do more of. The third area that I want to talk a little bit about is people-to-people ties. And I, I spoke a little bit about how Historically, um, you know, we've been allies and friends from the very beginning, from the very independence of Bangladesh. But those ties have grown over the years as well. Um, right now, we have uh, 10,000 students from Bangladesh going to Canada every year, and it keeps increasing. Some of them are here <laughs> at the table. Um, we have over 200,000 Bangladeshi Canadians, and we have some of those around the table too who are increasingly involved in business in both countries and contributing uh, to both countries. We want to encourage that. Um, we also, uh, as part of the IPS, are committing ourselves to improve visa processing capacities in the region uh, and to uh, increase Canadian technical assistance. We want to bring in you know, hundreds of experts into the region in some of the areas uh, that I mentioned or others. And we also want to, of course, continue uh, providing <laughs> our international assistance to Bangladesh. And in the case of international assistance, um, as I said, it's evolved over time, but Canada has been quite key in supporting Bangladesh in areas like um, health. Uh, a lot of the nurse training that has happened in Bangladesh, and one of the reasons that Bangladesh did so well during COVID was because of its magnificent nurses. Uh, Canada has been a big part in helping Bangladesh build such a strong nursing country. 
uh, sexual and reproductive health rights, um, health research, support, for example, to the ICCDRB uh, has been a critical, those are part of Canadian international sense of contribution. And, we're, and of course, supporting my, uh, Bangladesh's famous microfinance and women's empowerment movement. Uh, Canada was there from the beginning supporting RAC, uh, Good Day supports the Banner uh, Journal Foundation, and our Polka. So Canada will continue to support Bangladesh in those areas. And even though a large part of Canadian international business goes to uh, Bohemia refugees, um, that is additional funding. Uh, the, the Bangladesh you know, bilateral program has always been maintained. Um, it has always included support um, to host communities as well as to Rohingya. So those are some of like, the key areas that I wanted to mention. Um, the kind of final pillar of the IPS, of the Canadian IPS, that's kind of like the most cross-cutting, is that of creating, you know, active, engagement in the region. And as I mentioned, it's a long-term strategy, it's multifaceted, um, and the idea is you know to create deeper, multifaceted, long lasting linkages. And here I just want to highlight that Canada and Bangladesh have a lot of values and interests in common. We're both multilateralists, you know we both live beside superpowers. I think Pierre Trudeau once said that, you know, when he was describing to Canada, it was almost like a, a mouse sleeping next to an elephant. And then you know, whenever it, it moves or grants, you, you feel everything. So it's in our interest to have a multilateral system, to be part of a multilateral system that is rules based. Right? It benefits us. Um, you know, we're both Democrats, we're both societies that are diverse and, and rely on that diversity as well. Um, so, more joins us than divides us, uh, and we have a history of working in partnership based on mutual respect. So it's very important as part of the military strategy um, that we continue to deepen those relations. Now, having said that, I think I mentioned from the beginning that I will end by mentioning a few challenges, but, but also I'm going to put them as questions to you because you are the expert. Um, one um, question that I have is that um, a lot of the Indo-Pacific strategies uh, that have been put out there, often when we talk about them, um, people, of, experts often say that it's about choosing sides. You know, it's an increasingly a polarized world. We know that. So my question to us is, does the Indo-Pacific strategy need to be about choosing sides? Is it just that, or can it be more than that? So that's one challenge, but also a question. Um, the other thing that I really want to uh, put forward to you as, as a challenge is that, you know, I think that hopefully you've gotten from my presentation that the Canadian IPS is about promoting Canadian interests. There's no doubt about that, but it's also about advancing Canadian values and what we consider our universal values. But what happens when those interests and those values are at odds with one another. So what happens if our values or our interests are not the same? How do we collaborate in those circumstances? Um, and then the third question and the third challenge, of course, um, and I think, you know, um, General alluded to this, is that uh, these strategies are so broad, um, they're so big, they're so multifaceted. How do we prioritize? How do we find concrete area uh, of critical mass where we can make a contribution together. So I leave you with some of these. I know these are not easy questions. I know they cannot be answered in a few moments. But I just want you to know that these are issues that we're thinking about um, and that we really value hearing from, from U.S. panelists and, and U.S. experts uh, learning from, from your perspectives and, and your views. Thank you. Go back. As you heard from the High Commissioner, it does meet the key strategic objectives of the Canadian IPS, which basically has five interconnected strategic objectives, and they're to promote peace, resilience, and security, number to expand trade, investment, and 
supply chain resilience. Number three, invest in connected people. People are in the center. Number four, build sustainable and green future. And number five, Canada as an active and engaged partner in the region. So the depiction that you heard from my commissioner does work towards that end. Our next speaker on the panel is Mr. Tohi Dosen, the former Foreign Secretary in the government of Bangladesh. And Tohi, you have the floor for the next 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, am I audible? Yes. No. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, President Diabetes, and, uh, and uh, thanks to the Commissioner for an excellent presentation. Actually, not, there's not much to say about the uh, strategy per se, but we just discuss a few points. Uh, say, for example, that uh, Canada looks forward to a peaceful and prosperous future. That is very clear from this. And um, starting with the importance of the uh, of the region, it has listed 40 countries that uh, the, their strategy concerns. Basically, include the Pacific Asia, it used to be uh, when there was no Indo Pacific strategy, but only the uh, Asia Pacific strategy. At South, uh, Southeast Asia, it was there, part of it was over there, and South Asia comes in. Two important countries are left out uh, in the Indian Ocean, one is uh, Iran, the other is Korea. And uh, with the Chinese police uh, <coughs> in Djibouti, I think uh, the Horn of Africa should form a part of any university uh, uh, The president has uh, mentioned about five, but I basically look at three of the important aspects economic opportunities, peace and security, and this we uh, attract my attention uh, more. Um, the question of uh, the supply chain has come up. Today is a lesson learned from the uh, from the COVID pandemic and the over dependence on China by the entire world for anything that they do. Now, in all these three areas, China is really important. The strategy has mentioned, I quote, China's rise as a global actor is reshaping the strategic outlook of every state in the region, including China. China has benefited from the rules based international order to grow and prosper, but is now actively seeking to reinterpret these rules to gain international recognition. This is one thing that needs to be uh, the uh, statistics, they can be very careful about it. The Canadian strategy vis a vis China looks for the economic opportunities for China because basically every country looks for its own interests uh, in terms of market access and in terms of uh, investment. But at the same time, they critical of China on democracy, human rights, and ability. Right? It says that, quote, Canada will pursue dialogue with China to advance Canada's national interests while remaining true to our values. Now, uh, the High Commissioner has actually uh, put a question on this that what happens when these two are in conflict? These two are often, very often in conflict, anywhere in the world. Not only for Canada, but other sources. Uh, and um, as we observe, usually interest comes first. Whatever value you might say, when the interest is in your body, you just give your value and then go for your interest. That is what we see normally in the, in the international arena. But if we look at the long term interest, because often we don't like to see beyond our nose. If you look at the long-term interest, sometimes sticking to the uh, sticking to the principles, the value uh, is going to take a lot. Okay. Uh, apart from the security aspect, I think the dilemma in the coming years will be a conflict with the economic benefits and the values, as we have already mentioned. The current trajectory will make China the dominant power in the region. And maybe in the world, in the region, notwithstanding the growth of uh, India, China will 
going by the characters, it will become the uh, most uh, dominant character. Now, be it so, China as a dominant power is not going to be democratic in the Western sense. Nor is it likely to that it will set any priority on human rights. In Canadian, uh, the Canadian studies that I have seen does not have a clear direction as to how to resolve this error. This factor, I think, needs to be looked at. With China becoming dominant, the other priorities in the Canadian strategy are likely to be achieved, are unlikely to be achieved, excluding, of course, economic benefits. That for the business is particularly that is that in particular, but uh, the other targets of Canada uh, Pacific are clear. On the security concerns, the strategy speaks about other or Chinese ambition in South and East China seas and her position on Taiwan. Uh, it speaks of uh, how China, uh, Canada is going to attack. It speaks about enhanced military presence, cooperation in training, intelligence, etc., with other regional powers to safeguard Canadian, and I understand that it's by extension the Western interests. A lot will depend on the extent to which Canada will be ready to be actively involved. That's not a clear question. The US in the Pacific strategy, on the other hand, has a very clear priority of containing China, not allowing it to become overwhelmed in the uh, Maybe the interests of Canada would be similar, but then that's not uh, the, uh, that's not really the way that uh, Canada at present looks at. The Canadian studies identified India as a critical partner in Canada's pursuit of its strategies. Canada and India, it says, have a shared tradition of democracy and pluralism, a common commitment to a rules based international system, and much. With India, it seeks to, I quote, grow economic ties, including through deeper trade and investment, as well as cooperate on building resilient supply chains. Fine. As the regional hegemon, and as an important regional and global player, India's importance is undeniable, and the growing economic ties is also understandable. However, the enthusiasm about democracy, Multilateralism, etc., have to be taken into consideration. For the last 10 years at least, there has been a persistent erosion of democratic norms in this oft applauded world's biggest democracy. In regional matters, India has always opposed multilateralism. On India's human rights records, we could just look at the letter written by the 75 Pakistan during the Modi visit or listen to what this environment was it. And the worries that has been expressed by the India civil society. The Bangladesh in the Pacific Outlook is a very generic topic. It starts on a image of friendship towards all and malice towards none. This is a great expired concept and will take us from that. The objective, as stated in the outlook, are also all in general terms. Almost looking like a human generation debate. Bangladesh, of course, has compulsions for which she has to maintain some part neutral stand. There are however two elements that are important. One, the support for a rule based multilateral system. And two, uh, maritime safety and security in terms of international conventions, including health laws. These provisions bring it closer to the Canadian as well as the US strategy. These are also reflected in the joint statement issued after the recent visit of Bangladesh Prime Minister in Japan. Apart from listing in the 40 countries I made, and what the uh, High Commission has mentioned about uh, the uh, role or importance of Bangladesh, Bangladesh, the eighth largest country by population, having a consistent economic growth for the last 20 years and located in an important position in the Bay of Bengal, finds very little mention in the Bangladesh. Bangladesh could play an important role in the supply chain resilience. The country had its problems 
particularly in this world of air politics. But it will undeniably become an important region of their life. This perhaps needs to be recognized. The current government mentions rising violence in Myanmar following the military coup d'etat as a strategic challenge. Unfortunately, the genocide committed by the regime in 2017, while the supposedly democratic regime of Suchi was in power, has not been mentioned. I think this is to be recognized that it is not the military regime or the coup d'etat, the abject situation in Myanmar starts at eye. He speaks of fully implementing the next phase of Canada economic strategy and support to peace building in Myanmar. There can be no peace without justice. And there is a blatant denial of justice to the Rohingya people for a long time. The importance of the Rakhine coastline in the Chinese plan strategy also needs to be recognized. China's access to the Bay of Bengal is dependent on Myanmar. And this explains why Chinese strong support for the genocidal regime and not stand behind, beside the uh, Rohingyas. I think these uh, factors, particularly the uh, Myanmar factor, deserves much more uh, space and importance in the, uh, in the best history of any nation, including uh, India. Thank you for your wonderful analysis. And um, I couldn't agree more on some of the points you mentioned. <coughs> In my own understanding, also, I see that a complete region of Eastern Africa, which is part of the region, has not been addressed at all. In terms of addressing South Asia, which is home to a very large mass of human population, it only touches India. In some ways, in my understanding, undue importance has been given to the centrality of ASEAN. ASEAN is important, but it is not critical only to the Asian atmosphere. Aspects of South Asia, besides India, needs to be addressed. And that is to say that that can only make the strategy comprehensive. I also fail to understand the duality of the attitude and objectives as far as China is concerned. Because in some ways the strategy follows a aspect of cage and engage. It hedges China on several reforms. But at the same time, it says that the Chinese economy offers significant opportunities to Canadian exporters. So in no way it can disengage. There is no way to decouple. It also says that we will cooperate with China to find solutions to global issues, such as climate change, biodiversity loss, global health, and nuclear proliferation. And those are aspects that needs engagement. So I think more critical clarity on how this policy of age and engage will work needs to be understood. But I'm sure our next speakers will address some of these issues. And I, will, I have the pleasure to give the floor to Professor Karim Abbasi, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Economics in East West University. Professor, you have the floor for next 10 minutes. Thank you, General. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, while I was sitting over here listening to this massive discussion from all of you who discussed this, I almost felt like Neil Pitney Younger was the Prime Minister of Great Britain in the Napoleonic Wars. Because after the Battle of Austerlitz, when Napoleon Bonaparte won a decisive victory, he said the role of the map of Europe will only be for 10 years. I said, whatever I have come to the preparation, I will it out for the year. But, oh yes, but is it better now? But 
let's focus on certain areas or certain engagements or topics which have not been covered but there's some degree of knowledge uh, I still have nine minutes so I'll give you a rough outline of my presentation the first one is to focus on Canada's previous contribution in international diplomacy, which is often forgotten or not liked, or basically not sufficient light is shared in many of the countries like Bangladesh. Number two, Canada's role in the Indo Pacific, old or new. And number three, the elephant in the room is again Canada China relations. Why does it occupy so much of a central position in Indo Pacific strategy of Canada? And again, why it concerns us. Number four, potential areas of Canada Bangladesh cooperation under the IPS framework. And number five, a few suggestions if I have the time. So, first of all, <clears throat> let me begin with a comment of a famous American historian, which is again William Morris, that only great powers are capable of coming up with grand strategies, middle powers respond to. But I would say, I would say, the Canada situation, as the High Commissioner rightly pointed out, is quite akin to Bangladesh. Canada is again enjoys very comfy relationship with its largest neighbor down south the US. But China is also an important factor. Similarly, Bangladesh is surrounded on India on three sides and is a very important neighbor. But China has also increasingly become important. So on that level, we have a certain degree of superficial similarity. However, what the Indo-Pacific strategy of Canada has uh, signaled to the world, and that's my uh, opinion, is an end to strategic ambiguity. Because for a long period of time, Canada wanted to come up with a middle ground, a niche area of, again, responsible engagement, but with a specific uh, intent. But, again, I think now that Canada is shedding that image and it's firmly outlining where it will stand in the coming new Cold War. If we go back to history, or again, uh, again history is a mystery for most of us and we do have very little patience for it. But Canadian role in the international arena has not been even uh, publicized that much. Because again, the human peacekeeping operations from which Bangladesh also benefits and the responsible partner has been initiated by the legendary Western leaders of the airport in the protocol of the Department that way. Again, Canada was at the forefront in negotiating this very successful Ottawa Convention on Landmines. And also the right to protect, uh, which has become a fundamental creed of the United Nations over there, also Canada plays a major role. That is again just one or two or three of the salient contributions to Canada. Now, in terms of Indo Pacific, Indo Pacific, Canada's involvement, well, why? Because the US has gone over there, so all the other countries are going. But you are ignoring an important geographical narrative. As the second largest country in the world after Russia, Canada is also a passive nation. And the Former Prime Minister and former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, there was greater engagement in Asia as a whole during the 80s and the 90s. In fact, Canada's engagement with Asia or Asia Pacific basically stopped or receded after the Asian financial crisis. But all of it changed in 2015 following the strategy report. And in 2016, we saw that under the Liberal Party, again, there was greater engagement with China and with ASEAN countries and also with India and Asia, uh, Japan, South Korea, the entire world. So Canada is basically recovering lost ground under different realities. Now, if we look into this, now the question comes in, then why has Canada-China relations hour? Because it doesn't make sense. Because in one sense, though the US is Canada's largest trading partner in terms of accounting for 75 percent of its exports and 62 percent of its imports. If you look at Western Canada, its dependence is on China, its dependence is on Japan, its dependence is on South Korea. But a series of unfortunate events have basically hardened perception. And you see that domestic surveys time and again shows that the, there is popular support 
or stronger Canadian measures against the central Chinese government or against the, against the government of Beijing, not necessarily the Chinese people. What are those? First of all, failure to sign a free trade agreement. In 2016, there was back to back reciprocal visits by the Chinese and Canadian premiers. But even then, even then, uh, Li Keqiang and just, uh, Justin Trudeau, even then there was uh, the free trade agreement did not get signed. Why? Because there was political pressure from the lawmakers in Ottawa to include labor rights with China. The next one, and unfortunately this was even more uh, unfortunate, was Canada's detention of the daughter of Huawei's owner, Meng Wenzhou, and again to await extradition for arrest in the United States, which led to the arrest of two, the two Canadian Michaels. One was uh, Michael Corvick and one another was Michael Sars, Pavor, which again led to greater deterioration of relations. Also, there was increased alarm about alleged, but again, I'm not a Canadian, so I can't say from first time what has happened, is greater activities and later includes operations by Chinese Communist Party operatives within Canada amongst Canadians of Chinese origin. So this also caused major alarm. Apart from this, there is also growing concern about CCP operatives and scientists affiliated with CCP who are basically engaged in research uh, or in, in industrial espionage, in research and again intellectual property rights violation within Canadian state-run and Canadian uh, sponsored uh, Canadian academic university. So protection of Canadian intellectual property rights and research has also become a focus. See, these are the Canadian concerns. And also, along with this, there has been also serious allegations of tampering in the federal election results of 2021. Again, all are Canadian movements. I am not speaking for or against, I'm just giving you the background. Because in Bangladesh, it's oh, Canada, it will always follow what the United States is, but well, Canada is all that. So I've set the ground rule right here. Now, again, in terms of multifaceted engagement, there's a paradigmatic shift. Because previously, Canada's uh, global affairs uh, speak, it was referred to at least for Asia visit. Now it has turned to Indo Pacific. It is obviously referred to one in five Canadian citizens are of Indo Pacific origin. Apart from this, apart from this uh, insight, they are saying that we will cooperate with China on issues such as nuclear proliferation or on, again, on climate change, but we will also compete on China in terms of rules based order violation, according to Canadian inter interpretation. Or again, also freedom of nighttime access across the Taiwan Strait, Southeast China, East China Sea, and Canada's bigger focus, as Ambassador Tori was in, as Master Kuhn pointed out, is and they have pointed out because of the limited uh, military overreach, is basically the Western Pacific, where they're committed to add a third brigade. But this also has its own military dynamics because Canada has been cutting down on expedition military. They request 1,500 sailors to man this the third brigade. But again, Canada will come up with its own strategy. But I'm saying this that again, it will work with a segment of its allies, mainly Japan, South Korea, and Indonesia. And in terms of economic engagement, again, it is on its way of basically signing a free trade agreement with ASEAN, a comprehensive economic partnership agreement with Indonesia. And a potential comprehensive economic partnership agreement with India after an interim trade agreement. Now, let me quickly come to areas where Bangladesh and Canada can benefit the Canadian university strategy. Though Canada is the home of that territory, and again, in this case, it has a lot of homegrown expertise, which again, fortunately or unfortunately, is exported down south to the United States. The idea is that global digital and services economy, that should have been much more to emphasize in the university respect. And with Bangladesh's own ongoing uh, digital revolution, we address areas for technology transfer, technology collaboration, and building up of our own domestic research capability. And strengthening our intellectual property rights and duties, never cross the line. If you don't have an intellectual property rights regime over here, R&D will never flourish. That's number one. 
Number two is tapping in, into the financial development kind of fund and also the shared ocean fund under the Indo-Pacific strategy. The financial development fund over there, because of our already uh, what we say advantage with basically things like our institutions such as BRAC or Grameen or other NGOs, we can tap into greater funds for sustainable financial development. Number two, in case of the ocean fund, a shared ocean fund, Canadian assistance can be pivotal for reducing UIU. What is UIU? Unreported and unregulated fishing in the Bay of Bengal. Because we have won the verdicts, we have had a greater expanded economic, uh, maritime economic zone, but now it is caused prey to fishing, illegal fishing operations. Chinese trawlers or Thai trawlers or Myanmar trawlers come in. So this is where we can get in Canadian support, concerted Canadian support. These are actionable agendas. Number three over here is also Canada is also championing sustainable development, green energy. Over here, one area that I'd like our lawmakers to focus is powering fast coal alliance. So where we can transition from coal energy to green energy, where Canada has a competitive edge in the global arena. Number four. Over here, another one is, we forget about this, LNG exports. Canada's rising LNG exports means that our also, our economy is industrializing, we require LNG. And LNG cargoes from there, we can also, again, as a means of diversifying our energy stock. Because in the Middle East, global LNG power is not infinite. And also it's prone to get including instabilities. Over there, we can also diversify. Last but not the least, this is also the case of agricultural produce. Now we know that China has imposed ban on canola oil, and there is speculation that Canada's import of 10 billion dollars of agricultural products will be curtailed. Canola oil, canola seed, this could be also important to basically reduce our reliance on soybean oil and palm oil. So Canada, again, this is another complete area of engagement. Last but not least, and this is the part where I go in the one minute suggestion over here. We want we know that again Canada wants to engage in basically building up greater governance, greater clarity, and greater transference. But I will tell you as a friend, as a person who has benefited from the Canadian education system, I went out of the Punjab scholarship and he paid to the Canadian taxpayers' money. That Claims of the fact that again the Canada or the West, let's talk about Canada, is that they are all for promoting greater transparency. We can take it more seriously when, in terms of immigration, we know more and more Bangladeshis migrate to Canada. There's greater regulation because, of, yes, the problem is that the Maya Pope, because of this corruption, if there's importing wealth, people are trying to basically whiten it. But when these same people drive up the real estate price in Ottawa or Toronto, then the idea is should Canada be serving as a laundromat for white men back money over here? So, again, there should be greater government to government or civil society and civil society engagement in terms of transfer of funds. Yes, but I am not basically negating or abdicating responsibility on our part. It is also our part. But if the West also <coughs> wants to be us to be serious on accountability, corruption, there should be a reciprocal. Uh, cooperation in regulating these affairs. So, on these few humble suggestions, General uh, Muni, I intervene. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Professor, as usual, you came up with a lot of innovative ideas. And when you spoke about transparency, I know you are alluding to the so called Bacon Park. <laughs> The transfers of the money that is being transferred from Bangladesh to, to Canada and other countries of the West. It's a very comprehensive and a large strategy. So, in a short span of time, we cannot probably highlight everything that is in there, but I will continue to inject some of the key highlights that is in the paper. The Canadian uh, IPS does lay a lot of importance of cyber capacity and cyber threats. It wants to increase cyber capacity not only for Canada, but also for its partners. So therefore, it speaks of things like ransomware. It is going to fight the disinformation campaign that we all threatened with. 
and that's a key aspect of IPS. It does talk about more security cooperation, but unfortunately, uh, I have a difficulty in understanding why the security cooperation is only limited to Southeast Asia and why not to the rest of Asia or rest of the countries of the region. In terms of its expanded military capacity building support that it is going to provide, the countries that are included are Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Vietnam. So again, the focus is on Southeast Asia. In some ways, South Asia is not featured in any of the cooperation mechanism that it talks about. I'm also very impressed with the aspect of the feminist policy that it articulates. And as you know, Canada is a champion of feminist policies in all aspects of national policy planning. I also see with hope that it does speak about a sustainable green future, which is the way to go in all countries of the world. It speaks about the centrality of people and people to people contact. But what I would like to suggest is we have to have people to people contact. If we have to have ease of traveling, the kind of visa restriction that exists today, it impedes people to travel to Canada. So we have to look at those areas. Because unless people to people have contacts, countries cannot have contacts. So with those thoughts, I will now open the floor for questions and comments. Please indicate to me that if you want to ask a question or make a comment, I'll give you the floor. The first question is from Dr. Chaudhary. Microphone here, please. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Uh, I like the way you sort of conduct the proceedings by inserting substantial elements as you as you uh, pass the microphone to the microphone. And my commissioner, I thought your presentation was very good. I like the way in which you sort of uh, align the five pillars of, of the Indo-Pacific strategy in relation to vulnerability, basically your, your responsibility, and you did a wonderful job of came to, but also your association with the UNDP at a very critical period of the report of the Maruba Lucky era, where human development was at the core of UN enterprise. So thank you very much. And also for even uh, your, your presentation uh, for this there. Excellent. I have uh, one, a comment and a question. You see, this is with regard to almost theoretical, with regard to the change of terminology from Asia Pacific to uh, Indo Pacific. I mean, it may seem like sort of a, from something like a passive expression with Asia Pacific to Indo Pacific, which was actually a cartographic uh, definition. But of course, it has huge implications. One of the implications, of course, is the salience of security rather than other factors and other pillars that you described. You, you've spoken a bit of all of Munir, I think, much of the 13 uh, countries, the countries which have, uh, have uh, uh, strategies. And you said many of the strategies are like uh, United Nations resolutions. But some of them are like resolutions without the, uh, the actionable uh, the process, without the, the, the operation of process. Now, what happens, I and mean, it's almost a magic, logical development, when you, when you make a change like that, uh, there is an erosion of values in preference to the other pillars. Uh, in Canada itself, for instance, I, I understand that there is something that you can say, the focus on Timor Leste uh, has now disappeared. And I've lived in Australia, and I've lived in Singapore, and I knew that Canada had a, a tremendous contribution to, 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 to Timor Leste. So, so there has been an erosion of that, and the way also was uh, advanced to that, and the way of the, the excellent analysis of how that came about. So the question is, is sus in international relations, uh, is, it, uh, is sustained policy not a 
have been in the policy. Why do we change these policy names and and uh, uh, which uh, impacts on continued continuity of, of policy? In Canada itself, was not the policy because the Asia Pacific policy and then came. So, uh, so that is the thing. Uh, new policies are better than rather uh, than sustaining old policies and and keeping the same emphasis rather than what happens in Indian society, some critical elements of a nation policy, as you do erode the emphasis on, 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 the, on the value that we always have to drop the strong place on the international. Thank you. Zion? Please be brief with your interventions so that I can go to as many people as possible. Thank you very much, sir. I'm Dr. Zafi Bela. My current position is uh, American International University of Bangladesh and also University of Red in the United Kingdom. I think that is visible. Thank you very much. I'll actually pick up the question that was posed to the audience, uh, which remains unanswered. The first one was, of course, uh, does this independent strategy has to be uh, about choosing side? As an academic, I'll approach this from an academic start with the answering your question from an academic point of view. It does appear uh, mainstream uh, sort of thoughts as a uh, choosing side because a lot of us, and particularly in the higher scholarship, are obsessed with the realism and liberalism theory, which has been explained, for example, before uh, the, Cold War, uh, the end of Cold War. So there is another theory which is less talked about. Uh, which actually, actually appeared uh, in 1989, around after the Cold War, it's called constructivism. There are some good scholars from Canada on that, and I was invited to the University of Saskatchewan, the Canadian uh, Political Studies Association by conference, who was in the UK. They are very much aware of it. Constructivism basically answers the question that if we take an approach to see the international relations through the constructivist lens, that it doesn't need to be uh, confrontational or choose the side. Because constructivism believes, and one of the main problems that we developed in the event, that anarchy is what states make of. We construct. We are not in a constant state of anarchy, as realists would argue, but it is what we have made of. And then it also relates to the other two points that you made, because it lays more emphasis on ideation of Africa and its values and the, and the uh, liberal values that we talk about, identities. And, and it sees the international relations as a process, not as a hegemonic or bandwagoning and all those kind of buzzwords. So I would say, if we take a very close look at what China is doing, or if we take a look at what uh, Basi, uh, my favorite person has just mentioned, how uh, Asia Pacific is turning in the Pacific, actually we have constructed it is a construction of so geopolitics and in much of the areas of international relations, it's a construction. And if you take that approach, it's not to be uh, confrontational or taking side. And obviously, uh, much of the things that happens currently and will happen in a particular, potentially multipolar world can be only explained not through the liberalism or maybe you know, realism, but more from the perspective of but my fundamental question to you is that you also have it that uh, Canada is going to uh, uh, sort of invest on visa processing. Okay. I think I read none of your visa processing centers that you're funding around 98 million is in Bangladesh. It's either in Indonesia or I think it's uh, one is in Vietnam, the other one is in Delhi or something like that. So do you have, or can you say anything to the audience here that? There will be a visa processing center in Bangladesh, and in the, in the, that kind of uh, facility will have here direct uh, from your embassy. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I'll bring another aspect of uh, an issue that is talked about briefly in the in the IPS here. We all know that we are going through a process of transformative technology, or in some cases, disruptive technologies. The IPS does not sufficiently address that issue. What it does, it talks about science, technology, and innovation partnership. But while talking about that, 
It does again limit to cooperation with a very few NATO countries that includes Japan, Republic of Korea, India, Singapore, and Taiwan. But innovative technologies are happening and springing up in all over Asia and Pacific. Smaller countries are even more innovative in some ways. So one of the best ways of cooperation would be to expand the horizons of cooperation and not limit it to few countries that are focused on them here. So this is an aspect that we might focus on. The next question is, anybody? Okay, sorry. Okay, I'm going, uh, we'll do another round, uh, yeah. but and you, you're asking such important and big questions, but I hope I'm not the only one that has to answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with some of them. Um, thank you, by the way, for uh, this amazing uh, honor to our panelists and your excellent questions. Um, maybe if I can just start with the first question about sustained quality. And um, I think that um, because the world changes, I think our policies have to change and the world has evolved, but I think the values uh, stay the same. <coughs> and I think this is what this Indo-Pacific policy is trying to say. Uh, so the world has changed. I mean, we've seen in my lifetime, uh, when I went to university, um, globally, you know, two thirds of the world's population was in extreme poverty. And today, globally, it's like less than one third. So the world has changed. We've seen over 100 middle income countries emerge, including Bangladesh, who at one point was called a basket case. Bangladesh is now a middle income country and about to become a graduate of LDC status. So the world has changed. And the world has changed in terms of China as well. Uh, you know, we've, we've seen China in our lifetimes emerge uh, from, you know, a poverty-stricken country uh, to into an emerging superpower and a disruptive superpower. So I think this policy, I think a lot of the other IPSs respond uh, to the changing world. Um, and I think that's, that's inevitable that the foreign policy may change. But the values, uh, at least for us, I mean, uh, I think it was you pervasive that it is a distinctly Canadian foreign policy. It's reacting to the way Canada has seen the world emerge, the way Canada has changed. Uh, Canada is much more uh, diverse than it was even 30 years ago, although Canada has always been a, a country of immigrants, but even more so today. Uh, and our links to, to the uh, Indo Pacific have increased as well. So it, it's responding to that. But the values are key. Um, so I just want to say that uh, um, um, in terms of uh, like the focus um, of the IPS, I think that uh, it's important to keep in mind that the IPS is a general um, and living and evolving strategy. So it's really up to um, all of us what we make of it. I mean, the IPS is putting out there, it's putting a new focus on the region, it's putting resources in the region, it's putting considerable funding out in the region and there's lots of mechanisms in the IPS that we can compete for uh, funding uh, you know so all those uh, the, the trade representatives the trade missions the technical assistance uh, all those are open to any nation including to Bangladesh which is why we in, in, in the mission here are very interested in finding a few key areas uh, where we can really really uh, move forward together and thank you for those of you given uh, specific comments uh, as to what some of those areas might be. Um, in terms of the um, <laughs> the visa issue, um, you know, here is something where um, I think people have a very outdated view of the way visa processing takes place. Uh, for those of you who work inside an embassy, uh, visa processing does not take place the way anywhere in the world for anyone the way it did 30 years ago. So 30 years ago, every embassy uh, had a visa section and we had people processing papers. It was papers. Uh, today, visa processing in the world doesn't work that way. Uh, it's virtual and it's what we call hub and spoke model. So the Canadian visa processing system all over the world is a hub and spoke model. So there's hub offices. Um, so for example, in Asia, um, some hubs include Singapore 
and Philippines, and they froze it for the region, and it's virtual. Uh, so you no longer need, um, uh, because it's virtual, you no longer need people physically in an office anymore. So the visa processing uh, capacity for the Canadian government will be increased, and there is a recognition that uh, to have people to people connections, you need uh, more ease of movement. And believe me, I, I can tell you that all the ambassadors all over the world, the Canadian ambassadors, the one critique we usually make is that we want the issue of visa facilitator. Of course, COVID uh, did not help, right? But there is now an awareness of the need to increase that capacity. But the capacity doesn't have to be physically in a particular place. That's not what matters. Uh, you know, what matters is that you, your staff and maybe of the expertise there, right? I, I think that's the important thing of the commitment. Um, finally, the question about doctrine and paradigms, liberalism versus realism. I guess you could add, uh, you know, uh, neo-Marxism or constructivism. Um, and I think that, um, you know, um, here what the Indo-Pacific strategy is saying is that for Canada, Canada is probably, if you had to place Canada somewhere, we're probably the quintessential liberal internationalist. I mean, Canada, um, you, you mentioned it, uh, pervades, um, you know, grew up uh, as a nation state, um, as a multilateralist. Canada is a member of every single club you can think of. Francophonie, Commonwealth, NATO, North America. It's the one country that has free trade deals with every single country in Europe. So it's, it's our DNA to be a multilateralist. And I, I think that's what makes it interesting because I think Bangladesh has a little bit of that too. Uh, you know, and, you know, we have that similarity and, and that has to do with our history. Yes, we are like, uh, you know, pioneers of, of peacekeeping Canada. Uh, it was Canadians that, um, pioneered much of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, you know, and demining and climate change. Um, Nor Norway's a bit like that as well. It, it, there's a similarity there. So that liberal internationalist paradigm is, is part of the DNA, but also, um, you know, what this, Policy does, and this is being debated by academics in Canada. I think many PhDs will be written on this, it's injecting some realist uh, analysis in there as well, and it's saying like the world has changed. Wake up! And you describe it pervades. It's based um, in the Canadian case, based on our own experiences uh, with China and what's happened in the last uh, few years. And Canada is in this policy saying, you know, we will not, we are a, a global nation, a globalized nation. We will contribute to that. We're not going to abandon that, but we will protect core values and, and we will protect uh, the rules based global system. We need it. We have time for a couple of more questions. So, next question, Ambassador Shamim. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, good morning, and thanks to uh, the panel speakers. I have an observation that uh, just gets more in response to the observation that you just made. Uh, of course, I have given and I think you did it twice. And, uh, your summary is why the Indo Pacific uh, strategy of some of the countries are more focused on the countries in Southeast Asia. And I think you respond to that on the basis of this liberal assumption would be the proximity of these countries to China. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, please. Can I have a copy of this? Could you please introduce yourself when you ask? Yeah, please wait for the mic. Uh, yeah. My name is uh, Mohamed Kawadudin. I'm from Canadian International School Manager. And the honorable president of uh, IPS and Excellency and friends of Canada. So, Canada is a long time tested friend of Bangladesh. I think Bangladesh has been very good bilateral relationship with Canada, all of our people. And Canada's contribution to Bangladesh for the last 50 years, we just recently celebrated 50 years. My little friendship with Canada and Malaysia. All of us, we know about CEDA. For a long, long time, CEDA has not been present to Bangladesh. About 200,000 people from Bangladesh working and living in Canada and contributing back to you. Can I ask a question, please? Just 
So uh, my question is, I have to say what China is going to do this and what China is going to do this. I don't have a question. So I just want to mention at what uh, was that is happening here. Ten thousand uh, students going to Canada, to Canada from the university early. And uh, about China. So after the independence, we saw a lot of Chinese restaurants in Bangladesh. We enjoyed the food. But Chinese contribution to Bangladesh is visible only last few years, I think. And previously we didn't get this sort of contribution from China. So my point is the, what we're getting from Canadian side and look what we're getting from Bangladesh side. The third point is I think Bangladesh needs to have its own capability, financial independence, security, and, and so on. Not depending on global uh, global thing. Who you are in fact matters internationally. So who Bangladesh is with depend how strong economically, how strong security of Bangladesh. So I think the Indo Pacific strategy of Canada would help Bangladesh in a greater way. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, anyone? I should come here from Prof. Paul. Thank you. Um, I'd like to address uh, Your Excellency, High Commissioner, about I mean, the question I think Mr. Bahadur from her raised about choosing sides. And um, what I was thinking is that I mean, strictly speaking, no, we shouldn't be having to choose sides. But when you look realistically, uh, realistically at the issue, the US might not be very overtly saying, no, you can't be China's friend or anything. But there is that covert feeling. But China, on the other hand, has been extremely direct about it. The ambassador over here has said in no uncertain terms that uh, told us not to be a part of IPS, it's told Bangladesh. So it's sort of like forcing our hand to be uh, to choose sides, which uh, you know Bangladesh is finding itself in a you know in a hard between a rock and a hard place. So um, that is over there. I mean, Canadians' policy is much more, uh, maybe conducive, much more soft, much more liberal, much more understanding, but that's not so a bigger power the USA and China. China will be more direct about it. The USA might be a bit more of a sugar coated. So Bangladesh actually does find itself having to choose sides. That's just the point I wanted to raise and uh, what your opinion is. Thank you, Asha. Next question, Jeremy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I can understand. Uh, I'll make a comment and then a question. We have heard a lot about TPP, non specific partnership during the days of President Obama. The pure nation and I was a major part, partner. And then when President Trump came, he withdrew from TPP. Left at 11, they're still there. And now with this present uh, democratic government, they haven't gone back to TPP. Instead, I think the IPS has taken the foreground. I find the difference between TPP and IPA is basically the security question. Is it containing China? Is it become a major factor in Western policy for Asia or globally? And in the Canadian uh, strategic document, I find that they mentioned China as the most destructive global power. I call the word destructive. Now, my question here is uh, 
how do you uh, explain this? Explain this difference and this switch. And then how the Canadian diplomacy uh, described it, despite in fact that China is a major partner of USA and Canada in every aspect, every any aspect you talk about. Why can't the West think about more uh, <coughs> conciliatory approach in dealing with the security issue? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Ambassador Shamim, would you like to ask a question? Okay. Yeah, Professor. Uh, thank you, uh, Dancy Yassin, Professor at the Department of International Relations in East of uh, Thank you, Your Excellency, for a very excellent elaboration on the uh, Canada's ideas and then followed by two very um, learned uh, contributors so in this discussion. What I want to point out is that uh, we have a lot of discussion about why ideas and how we uh, shifted, uh, I mean, in the Pacific uh, region, how we shifted from Asia Pacific. Um, there are 13 ideas so far issued by a number of countries. One of the major conclusions in all of those is that the Indo Pacific region is not defined. This is something we forget and it is everywhere. Um, as America's ideas or Bangladesh's ideas or uh, any other ideas that are issued, uh, Indo Pacific region is not defined. Number one. Number two, uh, the shift is because um, from Asia Pacific to Indo Pacific region, because Malaysia and geopolitics include part of African um, continent as well. This is something often we fail to understand, fail to recognize, because Indo Pacific covers a wider um, uh, geopolitical region than Asia Pacific used to. Uh, number three, <laughs> um, I mean, yesterday I took about five hours class on. Constructivism and this IR, where uh, candidate for policy issue uh, uh, was discussed, and then of course, critical theory between Marxism and neo Marxism. So, constructivism is about the subjective recognition of an idea and law uh, that is prevalent in a particular uh, time, a particular time in international politics. So, I believe gain currency because it has certain value um, that is addressed by um, pacifications as well as Indo. Uh, nation. Uh, one thing is missing is that, as um, uh, pointed out by the discussions here, that uh, whenever we are talking about South Asia, it becomes, you know, Indo-centric. There is an Indo part of Indo Pacific, but South Asia is not, not all about India. There are other countries there. Um, uh, in 2019, in one of the residential programs uh, that I went to a Western country, they were surprised to hear that there is a country called Bangladesh. This was 2019. Uh, not only there is a country called Bangladesh, but also there is a small herd from Bangladesh who talks too much. And then, because women are coming from, uh, you know, uh, Muslim majority countries, generally are not supposed to talk. Um, so we have a lot of misperceptions. So I would uh, um, like to ask uh, uh, Her Excellency uh, about how to represent a changing Bangladesh, a changing South Asia, and what are the ways that we can further uh, the national interest of uh, Bangladesh and Canada together in this respect? Because Bangladesh is no longer uh, can be viewed from the outlook of uh, 1970s. And also, I would uh, like to take a quotation from Her Excellency, who mentioned that it's uh, not in our DNA not to be multilateral. Um, it's not in Bangladesh's DNA to choose sides. This is something also people should understand, and that is where the relevance of friendship towards all bilateral plans exists because uh, the world has changed, but certain things, Bangladesh's geographical region, it has not changed. We cannot, however, we want it to do it, uh, we cannot take Bangladesh out of this geographic region and push somewhere convenient to us. We cannot do that. We have to realize this particular reality. You live uh, beside a great power, we also live beside India. So we have to take a look of that particular side. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. The one aspect that I see that IPS talks about multi sectoral engagement, talks about engaging companies, talks about engaging trade and commerce, talks about science and technology engagement. It does not sufficiently discuss how does it want to engage the civil society. 
The civil society in each country is the engine that drives much of the policies. And unless we are very clear-eyed in how to engage the civil society, the policy sometimes will find it difficult to engage. Uh, next, and the last question is from Shafter. Thank you, Chair. I'm Shafter Pune from Gibbs. I want to pick up a thread uh, from where the Chair left earlier about security and defense cooperation, about Canada focusing more with ASEAN and not so much with South Asia. I think, uh, High Commissioner, you may have heard me say this before, I'm sure Brad has, that one of the weak areas in Canada Bangladesh relationship is our defense and security cooperation. Although, uh, as early as July 1972, the Bangladesh Armed Forces and the Canadian Forces had contact. But we do not see a lot in terms of engagement between the two militaries as of now. So I uh, sincerely request you and the High Commission that I think there is a lot that we can gain by having more exchanges between Canada and Bangladesh between the two armed forces, whether in terms of peacekeeping, in terms of WPS and other areas. So this is an area I think which really needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Shafta. Uh, we will now go back to our panelists to give their last thoughts and comments before you conclude. We'll start with the High Commissioner. Uh, again, excellent questions and, and comments. Uh, thank you so much, um, everyone. Um, let me um, try to uh, to just a uh, few of them at least, but also take advantage of the panelists who are the real experts. Um, on the um, issue of um, you know the Canadian IPS, you know why is it um, is it conciliatory? Is it divisive? I mean, I think that the, what's interesting about the Canadian IPS um, is what we described before. It's this mix of you know internationalism but realism. It's a distinctive Canadian experience. It's not reacting to any other country's uh, foreign policy. It's reacting, and I think Pervé described it, Canada's experience in its role in the world, how it perceives the world, and how it has seen uh, certain countries emerge, and how it has seen uh, its relations uh, with China. It's reacting to that as well. Um, I think that uh, the policy um, does not choose, I think it does not choose sides, but it chooses boundaries. And it it's based on, it chooses like Canadian interests as primal to Canada. So it is it's a distinct to Canadian, just the way that Bangladesh, by the way, we haven't spoken today uh, curiously much about Bangladesh's own Indo Pacific strategy. But obviously, the Canadian Indo Pacific strategy is rooted in Canada will protect its interests globally and Canada will protect the values that it stands for. It will choose when those two things align, of course. It, it's the most effective kind of collaboration. When they're at all with one another, I think whether it's Canada or any other country, we will have to choose values. Uh, if the values are at all or if it's their interest, there will have to be a choice. What values would you protect? As well as interest, of course. Um, so that, um, you know, I pose that question because I know how complex it is. Um, I agree that um, in the case of, um, you know, the, if you read the Indo Pacific strategy today, what comes out more is, of course, China and then the role of what we call Western uh, um, Pacific, uh, and then, of course, the ASEAN countries uh, as well. Um, but, you know, there is no reason why uh, we could not put Bangladesh at the center of, of that strategy to our own collaboration. And, and those areas of collaboration uh, should include trade, should include new areas uh, of technology, uh, you know, um, IT. Uh, it should include military uh, collaboration. Um, so by the way, Canada does um, collaborate quite closely with the military. As I mentioned, we just had a peacekeeping conference together in an area where we collaborate. Uh, Canada is working with BIPSTOR, for example, through the LC initiative uh, to build a barracks for women peacekeepers because Bangladesh is a world leader in that area. And we work together also in support of Bangladesh in the development of the National Action Plan uh, for women peacekeeping security. 
and whether they should really do receive training uh, in Canada as well. But we want to um, increase that collaboration and that engagement. And I think that's what the idea is saying, if you want to make it long term, you want to make it more systematic. Um, so I think um, maybe I'll just leave my comments there and allow the other panelists to chime in. Sorry, here's the floor for the last thoughts. Uh, just, I just touched upon one small issue, which is choosing side. Actually, choosing side doesn't mean uh, necessarily that uh, you ditch one side and the other. But then I think choosing side is more uh, just taking the side that is uh, where you have more interests, just like that. And of course, there's the question of, uh, although it's difficult to uh, defend your uh, values or the land, but then uh, taking the side where the values also correspond with the, with the other. And um, I think, for, say for example, uh, Bangladesh in, in the Rohingya crisis, we had uh, the so-called time-tested friends who have not stood by us in this great crisis that we have faced. Now, we have to to side and take help for those who are or who can be made to help us in this respect. I, I just uh, on the uh, choosing side thing, I just uh, have these few words. Thank you. Thank you. Provence, last one minute. Okay. This is always hanging. Thank you. In terms of choosing sides, Canada has already chosen this side. Across history, World War I, World War II, Cold War, it was the progress. So again, it doesn't need to be a politician about politicians. That's Canada's perspective. And I won't get any question on that anyway. Number two, I agree partially with Professor Malikora, as I mentioned before, the Malikora part. It's not on our DNA to choose sides, but I had a cabinet until push comes to shove. <laughs> Until our backside is on fire, we don't do side. It's a very South Asian concept. Look at our Indian leaders. We learn from them. Number three, we always complain that there is an Indocentric focus, rightly so. But again, the failing is ours. We have not done at all to step out of the shadow of India. When we go outside, we will find followers of two political parties fighting with each other on the streets. We don't have a joint caucus to bargain for Bangladesh's commercial strategic interest. We have Chagolnaya Union in Vancouver, which is a distant part of Bangladesh, with all due respect to Chagolnaya. A small country which is right to visual itself, though 98% homogeneous, homogeneous across, same across. We love to fight. We complain. Any foreign envoy we meet, if you are from a particular political affiliation, we complain about our uh, opposition or our opponents. And we thereby, we reduce our own stature. We wash out dirty laundry abroad with the Indians, with the Chinese, with the Americans, and if the Russians give us space, also with the Russians. So how will the international community take us seriously? Let's look at ourselves in the mirror. The reflection is not pretty. Why don't you engage with Canada? Let's buy more energy from there. It might cost us more, but now we have a more economic handle on the policy making. Penny wise pound foolish. And then we complain, why is Bangladesh being taken seriously? Do we take ourselves seriously? Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Well, this has been a rich presentation followed by rich questions and comments. I will not make an attempt to summarize such a rich discussion. All I have to say is that the rise of the Indo-Pacific as a new geostrategic construct is a once in a generation of rise. It needs a different kind of a strategic response and IPS of Canada and other countries is possibly a response to that kind of a question of a generational rise of the Indo-Pacific as a new geostrategic construct. The region poses many difficult challenges that is to be addressed collectively. 
single nations cannot address the issues of climate change, issues of cyber security, or issues of free and open in the Pacific, or issues of the global commons. They need collective response. The region also proposes vast opportunities in terms of manpower, economy, and trade. So all we should do is embark on a journey of collective growth and collective cooperation. And that is what exactly in the Pacific strategy is all about. So I thank you all for your participation today. And keep coming to this discussion because we encourage your discussion, your debates, and your thoughts. And please join me in thanking the High Commissioner and the panelists for a rich presentation. May I now request all of you to join us for a couple of coffee outside. Thank you.